Good morning to all members of the committee. I call this uh, hearing to order, and as is customary, we begin with a prayer. I call on Mr. Rankin to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing as we gather for this public accounts committee hearing. We pray for your guidance in the matters that will be discussed. We ask that you clearly show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm for the benefit of the Cayman Islands. Help us to work together and encourage each other to excellence. We ask that you would challenge each other to reach higher and further, to be the best we can be. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. Good morning again, everyone. It's good to see you all. It's been a few months since we've been together and held a, 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 um, a hearing. So glad to be back and to, to see everyone again. Look forward to a very productive day. Uh, this morning, we are here to examine the report from the, of the Auditor General's entitled The Government's Shift to Online Services, which was uh, dated in June of 2022. Um, we have had apologies this morning from Mr. Seymour, uh, who is unable to, to be here. I also wanted to uh, point out the fact that uh, Ms. Heather Bodden, who it, is, is conflicted uh, in terms of this hearing as she is the parliamentary secretary for the Ministry of Investment, Innovation and Social Development. So we recognize an, uh, that and uh, what, although she's present here in the chamber today, she will not participate in the questioning of witnesses and are otherwise participating publicly, but she will be here for the, uh, throughout the meeting. I also want to recognize uh, Mr. Julius Aurelio of the Auditor General's office. He's a manager in that office, and I believe you participated in the preparation of this report. So I welcome you uh, to the committee as well, and uh, you're welcome to stay for as long as you, you can or would like to today. Um, As we begin this hearing this morning, I would normally, I call upon now the Auditor General to make her opening remarks in, in introducing the report to the committee, and thereafter we will call our first witness into the chamber. Auditor General, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you, members of the Public Accounts Committee, um, colleague officials, and the listening public. Thank you for the opportunity to make some opening remarks. As you mentioned, the report we're considering is our report, The Government Shift to Online Services, published in June. The audit we, we undertook covered three main areas, strategic direction and governance, project planning and management, and performance and value for money. We reviewed four online projects to help inform our findings and conclusions for the second and third areas and those online projects were the police clearance certificates, vehicle and driver licenses, trade and business licenses, and planning permits. Firstly, I want to highlight that the government has shifted a large number of services online, and the Cayman Islands compares well when looking at the top 20 global government online services. The e-government unit has played a pivotal role in achieving this. I also want to highlight that the government has been working for a number of years on developing a national identity system that will enable more efficient and better joined up online services. However, at the time of my report, the system needed primary legislation before it could be rolled out. I'll now briefly summarise our findings in each of the three areas. Firstly, strategic direction and governance. The e-government unit drafted an e-government strategy in 2015, but this was never finalised. In 2021, the e-government unit started to develop a new strategy. 
The early draft of the 2021 strategy was better aligned with good practice, but it still had significant gaps. Namely, it did not include an objective in, on improving efficiency as there was no, and there was no explicit mention of better joining up government and the way it works. In relation to governance, the government's up a high level steering committee in 2015 to provide strategic oversight and prioritise the e-government's initiatives implementation. However, the committee did not meet after April 2017 and it's not clear how that role has been provided since then. There is no overarching governance framework for IT and e-government projects setting out a standardised approach. The lack of such a framework contributed to weak governance for some projects. For example, project sponsors were not clear about what their roles were. The second section on project planning and management, um, we found that effective project planning and management involves some key steps and documents to be prepared. And those documents are things like business cases, project plans, and project closure reports that identify lessons to be learned. From the four projects we reviewed, we found that only one had a business case. This meant that the objectives for and the benefits expected from the project were not clear, which makes it very difficult to measure their success later. However, all projects had timelines that set out key dates and responsibilities, but only one project had a complete project plan document and only one project did a closure report to, to learn lessons. Finally, on performance and value for money, the e-government unit has made some limited progress against the four objectives that were set out in the draft 2015 strategy. It is not clear if the government has achieved value from the four services that is shifted online. This is largely because the costs and the benefits of the project are unknown. Projects, sorry, the four projects. In relation to costs, budgets were not set for the projects and the cost to design, develop and deliver the new online services were not monitored. These are significant gaps. Firstly, because without knowing what things cost, you cannot determine the value that that, that investment has provided. Secondly, the government may be underreporting the value of its assets. If it does not know the cost to develop and build an online system, then it does not know the value of that needs to be capitalised and held in its accounts. The e-government unit and departments capture very limited performance information to demonstrate the benefits from bringing services online. However, take-up rates, that is the percentage of transactions done online, is being monitored. And it's good to note that the annual trend shows more and more online transactions being performed. However, many in indicators were not monitored like staff efficiency and how much each transaction costs the government to perform. We also reported that customers are generally satisfied, although this is not routinely measured for online services. My report makes a total of 17 recommendations, 14 to the government and three specifically to the e-government unit. All but one of these were accepted. And as you mentioned, I have today with me, um, as well as Mr. Julius Aurelio, who worked on the report, Miss Angela Cullen, who is the Deputy Auditor General and leads uh, the oversight of, of, of the performance audit practice. And with your position, permission, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Edgar Bennett, the audit project leader that also worked on this report, will be joining us later so he can hear the hearing, hearing firsthand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Auditor General, and I neglected also to mention and welcome uh, Ms. Teresa Walters as well from the Financial Secretary's Office, uh, in addition to the Financial Secretary being here, Ms. Teresa is uh, sitting in for the Accountant General, Mr. Matthew Tibbetts, so welcome to you as well. Okay, I think we are now ready to proceed with the uh, examination of our witnesses this morning to begin this hearing. So at this time I'd like to call on our first witness who is Mr. Ian Tibbetts, the Director of the E-Government Unit.
Good morning, Mr. Tibbetts. Welcome to the Public Accounts Committee and to this hearing. Um, I understand this. I, I believe that this is your first time appearing before the committee. So I, I extend a warm welcome to you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask you when we start get into the questioning, but before you answer your first question, if you would state your name and your position, uh, just for the record, we'll only require you to make that state that one time, but just make sure that we've got it right here in terms of the recording and the, the, the transcript. I'll ask you to uh, to state your name and position. So before I move forward, then I just want to open the the committee up to, to, to asking you questions. I do have a, a preamble that I'd like to, to read, uh, as is customary. And the Auditor General's report states that the government first launched its e-government initiative in 2010 and acknowledges that significant process, progress has been made since then with a number of government services now available online. This is indeed good news. We appreciate that the e-government unit is not involved in all e-government projects across government, and we don't expect you to be able to answer for all of them. But we are interested in those projects that the e-government unit is involved in and the central role that the unit has to play in delivering the e-government program. We understand from your responses to the Auditor General's report and recommendations that the e-government unit and the Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development plan to develop a government-wide e-government strategy. However, we also understand that developing the government-wide strategy may take some time to accomplish. Therefore, we are keen to know what measures can be taken to address the Auditor General's recommendations in the meantime. Members will follow up on this during the hearing this morning. So with that brief statement, I'm going to open, uh, the, open the, the hearing up to questions. And the first person to lead off with those questions is Mr. Rankin. Mr. Rankin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to welcome Mr. Tibbetts to this Public Accounts Committee hearing. Um, as the Auditor General alluded to in her opening statement and the brief remarks by the Chairman, the Auditor General report highlighted the need for a government strategy that is aligned with good practice and she also cited the United Nations guidance as good practice. Um, it's also noted that you prepared a draft e-government strategy in 2015, but this was never finalized and you started working on a revised e-government strategy in 2021. The revised strategy was an improved version, but did not specifically mention objectives that will improve efficiency and of joining up government. Um, it is our understanding that from the responses to the Auditor General's recommendations that the e-government unit with the Ministry plans to submit Took proposals to cabinet in the fourth quarter of this year for a revised government-wide e-government strategy. However, the date for that completion is yet to be determined by cabinet. So therefore, the first question is, what are the reasons why the 2015 strategy was never finalized and what are the challenges arising from not having a formal approved strategy? Good morning, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is, I'm Ian Tibbetts, the director of the e-government unit within the Ministry of Innovation, Investment, Social Development. Thank you for the question, um, Mr. Rankin. And in terms of why the 2015 strategy was never finalized, it was drafted and it was presented to the e-government steering committee. It was being revised and worked with a subcommittee of the e-government steering committee and they, that was never finalized, and uh, as I think was mentioned, after, the 20, uh, after April 2017, the government steering committee 
uh, never reconvened. And the, is there a second part to the question, sorry? The second part was, were there any challenges arising from not having an formal approved strategy? So the, the strategy that was drafted, as I mentioned, was being worked through with the e-government steering committee. Um, and as the, the auditors will, will recall, I was um, quite confident that it had been approved in principle. However, I was unable to produce a um, document that reflected, a minute that reflected that. And so we, we were, the discussions and, and the committee were quite, the steering committee were aware and were in agreement with the, the, the strategy. And obviously we, you know, as, as things were moving along, we continued to work with that strategy at that stage. However, I think there is, it, it's worth noting that there is a significant change that occurred in, you know, relative to that timeline of April 2017. That was the last meeting prior to the, the election. And at, up until that point, the e the, my, my post, the director of e-government, which was a single, the only unit in the, only post in, in the team, um, was within the cabinet office. And the, uh, as such, there were no projects specifically for cabinet office. It was a general, we were there to, to serve everyone across. Uh, after the election, we were placed in a ministry um, with a portfolio, and the, there was a, a, a need to adapt the, the, the roles to fit within that, that environment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tibbet, can I just ask you, when you're speaking into the mic, you need about four to six inches away from it, uh, otherwise it's, it's getting reverbed. Thank you, sir. Can you update us then on what progress you have made with drafting that proposal for the government wide e government strategy and for the cabinet's consideration and approval? What progress have you made? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Rankin, the the progress to date has been limited. We have been extent, ex, um, extremely focused on the national ID and population register project and the re relevant legislation. Uh, however, we have had discussions between the ministry and the unit on in regards to the, the cabinet paper that is referenced. And we have it as a top priority to, to, to address. Uh, I think realistically, we are going to struggle given the season and given the, where the legislation is for the national ID, the, the progress on, towards the national ID legislation. I think we are going to struggle to achieve the end of Q4, in all honesty. Uh, I think that will, we will more realistically occur sometime in Q1 of, of 23. Because th that, that cabinet paper, sorry, sir, I think will take a, a fair bit of consideration because it does need to um, put forward the, the pros and cons of the different options and how we proceed. Um, and it will need to justify, if, if we go certain routes, it will need to justify funding, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, let us look a little bit further in the future then, end of Q123. How long after that do you think it will take to develop the government-wide e-government strategy once you get that approval? Through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rankin, um, the timeline will, determine, will be determined, I believe, largely by the, ex, the, the, the approach that Cabinet desires when we, when we seek that clarity. The, I think it, it's fair to say that the, the the strategy, the level of strategy that I believe is called for is a significant undertaking, something that we do not have the internal resources in the, certainly in the government unit. And I don't 
think the, the ministry does either to undertake. We will probably need to pursue a procurement for um, support for that process. You know, it will require significant research and um, uh, customer input and, and, and feedback and public consultation, et cetera. So I think depending on the approach and the, the extent of the, the strategy that cabinet so desires, will um, could makes that that time period very variable, sir. From probably month months to potentially years. I'm trying to process that <laughs> in terms of how for what you said and, and the reasons why it will take that long. But if we aim to deliver these online services to, to customers and internally, we will have to have some specific timelines in order to achieve what the government wants to achieve in terms of online services. Um, and then, okay, just going on now then, Will the new government's e-government strategy, will it aim to improve efficiency in joining up of the government? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Rankin, I, I think it is reasonable to expect that it, it, uh, it would. However, we, we're kind of presuming where, where it would go, but I think it is very reasonable to expect it would. Um, the, the, strategy that we start that we started working on internally because I think this is an example of what I was saying is depending on the scale of the strategy if I look at the the model that was referred to um, in terms of, of the the United Nations you know it speaks to under the, the strategy and implementation it talks about a national development strategy incorporating the United Nations sustainable development goals which makes specific reference to the use of new technologies, uh, which is aligned with the, with the um, SDGs, which is aligned with national development strategy. So as, as you can see, that level of strategy is, is quite significant, uh, the, the work to get there. And if it requires a procurement, typically, I think, you know, and having quite a bit of experience in, in going through our procurement process, it would range from the, our, our, our simple procurement process for something, um, uh, sorry, I, I would say the, the procurement process I would estimate that we'd be looking at for this is probably something that would take six months in of itself. Okay. So if I may, um, the, the point you made about services having to be delivered in the meantime, I think this is, this is exactly the, the situation we have found ourselves in. Um, you know, the old, the old colloquial saying of when, while the, gro the grass is growing, the horse is starving. <laughs> We've had to continue to ensure that we, that we progress during the time, whether, mm -hmm. whether our strategy was in the, under development or finalized, we had to ensure that we continue to, to progress. And for that, obviously, there's many good inputs. The, um, the, the strategic policy statements of the, of the government, and the um, budget process, setting of objectives as that, they get cascaded. So all of those have, have been um, used to drive the way forward in, in, the, in the meantime. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one last question on the strategic direction from me. Um, can you explain to us how the new e-government strategy will take into consideration the needs of users who won't readily have access to the internet, because I'm sure you guys are thinking about that, but how will it incorporate those persons? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rankin, the, in regards to persons that don't have access to internet, um, there are a number of options, and I think one of the, the things that we have focused on is to say that we don't expect to, fix, to, to address all problems with a single solution. So for persons that 
have that have online access if we can make it easy and efficient such that they choose to use that then we will have more time at counters to, f to facilitate persons that don't for example is is one one scenario however um, we have also looked at how we can deal with um, we're working on how to handle accessibility issues and using technology to allow assisted uh, access to persons with say dis certain impairments but that would prefer to use that method all right thank you sir questions from other members okay All right, let's uh, move on then to the assessment against the UN's criteria for e-government programs. Again, I call on Mr. Rankin to lead that discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the government aspires to be a world-class civil service and therefore needs to, un to understand how it compares against the best performing countries. As you can imagine, the United Nations has identified 19 criteria to determine the advancement of countries' e-government programs. In the response to Recommendation 5, you had stated that you would consider to the extent to which the United Nations criteria can inform the development of a government-wide e-government strategy. So with that, what is the progress in assessing the government's program against the United Nations criteria? and the outcome if it has already been completed. Through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rankin, uh, that is envisaged to be part of the work that goes into producing this cabinet paper, because I think this is some, these are some of the considerations that we have to put forward the cabinet when we go as to, to the extent to which we can apply these. Um, you know, it, it, the, I think the first part of the, the, the first paragraph of the recommendation um, the, or the document that the auditor said, as part of the, our audit, we compared the Cayman Islands e government program against the United Nations 19 criteria in 12 leading countries. However, it is worth noting that the Cayman Islands is not directly comparable to these countries and is, as it is a small jurisdiction and is likely to struggle to compete for the spe specialist expertise needed. So I think we have to, to take that into consideration and put forward to cabinet a, a very considered proposal as to how these may apply. For example, um, one of the things in here it, on the institutional framework, it speaks to uh, a national e government portal, which we have. It also speaks to a chief information officer. Um, and this is a, a structural change in how we would go about government. Now, the it, it is obviously debatable as to whether the cabinet's intention when they created the established the government program in 2014, of which I was fortunate to be the, the, the first um, appointed director of, of e-government unit, the, whether that was this uh, chief information officer post that is refer referenced here is intended to be equivalent, be that that came on scaled version of, of that post. And if so, then obviously that changes the paradigm from is it a yes or a no. However, as an official title, we do not currently have. I believe the ministry um, had some um, thoughts on, on doing this. I, I unfortunately can't speak to that. The, However, what we have look, started looking at as we can, in preparation for the, this cabinet paper are other models such as the model that Singapore uses where they have a, a GovTech organization and it, it closely aligns. Um, but we have, to, we have to assess whether that, how that might be applied and would be suitable in, in the Cayman context. Other than the Singapore model, what other models are you guys having a look at currently? We're, we're obviously, we're quite familiar with the Estonian model, which also applies this concept of a chief information officer. The question I think comes down to, is it a specific, 
person with that title or is there an equivalent title with the same role and functionality? Um, we obviously will, will look at other countries, but those are two of the most advanced today that, and both have that, that approach. But this would be something that the assessment itself would point you in and how would you develop that position of the Chief Information Officer, correct? Sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, when you say assessment, you mean the United Nations or the one that, or the exercise we intend to do? Yes, the exercise you intend to do. Sorry, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. Um, we would, part of that, the consideration that has to go in that cabinet paper would be considering this and proposing the, the options um, that we would recommend. All right, so no further questions for me. Others from the committee? All right, let's turn our attention now to next major segment, which is the, go the governance arrangements for e-government, for the e-government program. And for the person who will lead the questioning on this is Ms. Barbara Connolly. Barbara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone, and good morning to our distant public. I'm going to speak to the e-governance steering committee. The cabinet established an e-government steering committee back in 2015 to provide strategic oversight and prioritize the e-government initiatives implementation. However, the steering committee did not meet after April 2017, and it appears that no other formal governance and oversight arrangements were put in place after that. My first question to you, um, Mr. Tibbetts, is why did the steering committee not meet after April 2017? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Connolly, the steering committee, so the, the April 2017 was the last meeting prior to the election um, in 2017. After the election in 2017, the e-government unit was moved from cabinet office into the Ministry of Commerce, Planning and Infrastructure. And the, the ministries are, 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 to my understanding, resp more responsible for the interaction with the cabinet um, and the, the cabinet papers have to go from a from say the government, you don't have to go through the ministry. We were working with the ministry in reformatting the, in a proposal for reformatting the e-government steering committee. For example, the steering committee would have, a natural ev evolution would have been to change some of the membership. Um, the new chief officer wasn't part of the previous, uh, of the steering committee pre prior, the cabinet uh, secretary who was the chief officer, would have been the, re the relevant chief officer pre-election, was still on, was committee. So there, there are structural changes that were being discussed. And um, at the time, the chair, um, Mr. the Dep Honorable Deputy Governor, Mr. Madison, asked about organizing a, a steering committee meeting and to have Minister Hugh, at the, sorry, the then Minister Hugh, uh, at the meeting to present his in, intentions and, and desires for the steering committee. Um, I consulted uh, Mr. Hugh and he indicated at the time he wasn't ready for to pursue, proceed with that. He needed some more time to assess the situation, understand the, 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 the departments and the, the status, and that we would uh, uh, reconvene at a later point. Um, the, and 
subsequently, it, we never had a, a further meeting. Now, um, I think though, if the second part of your question was around the gov did you a did you ask or did you state the correct part about the governance after that point? Because I can elaborate on that. No, I didn't. But I, my second question is, it's now October, twenty twenty two, and that was two thousand April two thousand and seventeen. So is there still not a steering committee established as of today's date? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's gone. Th that is correct. There is no, there, there has not been a steering committee meeting since that point. Um, since that point, the, with the, the change in the structure um, and the reporting lines, the oversight and guidance has come through, a, I would say, a, a different approach, more the, the budget and objective setting and the involvement um, with the, the ministry and the relevant minister. Thank you, sir. Recommendation number two in the Auditor General's report states that the government should establish clear governance arrangements that provide effective oversight of the e-government programs. The management response is that the e-government unit will continue to satisfy governance arrangements in the following ways. Submitting monthly cabinet reports, holding regular meetings between e-government unit and the ministry, completion of an annual report, using all requested project tracking documents as required by CIG procedure and law. The Auditor General's report states that no formal governance and oversight arrangements were put in place after the committee ceased to meet after April 2017. My question is, what current governance arrangements are in place now and who provides oversight for the e-government program? Through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Connolly. Um, the, since, uh, continuing since, since the 2017, the process has been as is normal for most uh, departments and entities with via the, the budget. So we submit proposals, we submit, um, you know, for funding and the, those, we get guidance on, on which, pro, which proposals then cabinet will approve and fund and those translate into um, requirements and for, for outputs etc and get put into outputs put into objectives etc um, so that through that planning process and that approval the budget approval process that continues to to occur the in addition to that um, during from in that time since April 2017 it has continued where we have had um, a variety of different um, formats, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say formats. The, there have been regular sessions where we have the opportunity amongst the ministry to present to the minister at um, retreats, away days, um, where to give updates on the, the processes and the projects. What we have also done is we have put forward um, the, the projects that, that we have identified that we're aware of based on the demands, et cetera, and those uh, in get, um, if, there's, if there's a need to, to prioritize within them, then that is normally put forward to the ministry and or the minister. And it has, it has been done with the minister in, in some cases. 
Thank you, Mr. Tibbetts. So is there any indication that a steering committee will be established? I mean, I just, I'm a little, a little, a little lost for words in that, you know, we need to establish clear governance arrangements, but we have no committee established to, to steer, um, the, uh, you know, the ministry or your um, area um, in the right direction. So is there the current minister, does he have any appetite to have a, to establish a steering committee going forward? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Scott. Um, obviously, unfortunately, I'm unable to speak in behalf for what the for the minister's um, perspective or appetite on it. However, it is we intend to put that as part of that cabinet paper for consideration. Uh, you know, is that a model that is that is wanted? I will say that there are parts of the role that was intended for the steering committee that are a challenge to to operate, and I think uh, rec we c I would, it would be fair to say that it, the, st the steering committee, when it operated, there were aspects of its remit that it struggled with. Um, there are some logical things that I think we, we can, uh, I, I may elaborate on just really quickly, that we need to address, we need to figure out and how we, if we reconstitute the steering committee, et cetera, things like if the steering committee is going to prioritize and approve, how does that align to an, a, an existing ministry that has gotten funding and has a, an, a commitment to deliver something on a different time frame um, than the committee chooses to prioritize? So we have to, we have to work through how the, the practical logistics of some of those things occur. Um, where it works well is in the case where there is, and this is normally for smaller departments, et cetera, they do not have funding or have um, a specific project that get, got approved through the budget process. So now the steering committee can allocate funding to assist them um, or for things that occur midstream. So I think all of those need to be factored in in, in that proposal that goes back to cabinet and how, how we implement going forward if it's going to be a different model from what is there now. Um, and and we're, we're open to, to any approach as long as we, you know, it, as it, we, we think it will be, be, it can be effective and, and beneficial to the, the country, the government, et cetera. My last question on um, the steering committee and your role. Um, what role does the, your unit expect to have in any new governance arrangements? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Connolly. The One of the challenges that, that currently exists, and I think this is where the steering committee and I, I think where the, the, um, the, there's some real need to, to resolve is the autonomy that is there for anyone to, to move forward independently. And I think that's the logical place where the steering committee or the government unit um, would, would come in is to try to find a way to meet the needs of government, but in a in a very structured way, we started out um, with the authority of directives, and and it didn't work very well. We found that we had to, um, if we were going to actually make a difference and have success and, and ha help the the Cayman Islands government then we had to, to take a, a more collaborative um, and cooperative approach and be able to not just guide, but be able to do and deliver in many cases. And that's where 
where the department's role has changed significantly when we started, when it started out, it was me alone. Obviously, that wasn't a, it wouldn't have been expected to deliver all the pro all even to project manage all the projects or to actually execute whether it's procurement or, or development of software and hardware and you name it. So we have the department has grown um, as you will have also seen in the report and we're now better able to assist with actual implementation and we're also working um, with providing standards and guidelines um, for doing things and that would tie in well with the strategy. It's, we're working closely, for example, with the Deputy Governor's Office on some of the stuff that they're doing even now as an interim in how we um, implement a, a solution that is fit for purpose in the meantime. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tibbetts. I'm moving on now to governance framework for e-government projects. The Auditor General's report stated that there is no overarching governance framework for e-government projects, and this led to weaknesses in project governance. Examples of weak governance related to project sponsors not understanding their roles and key project documents not being reviewed and approved, which we will come on to later. For the audience, or for the public's um, edification, project sponsors are RCIPS, who owns the police clearance certificate online, and DCI, who owns the trade and business license um, online um, platforms. The Auditor General recommended that the Major Project Office Governance Framework for major capital projects could be adapted for IT and e-government projects. We note that you did not accept this recommendation. We note that you state the difference values uh, is the values of, pro of projects. However, we are not clear why the governance framework framework could not be adapted. So my question to you is, can you provide reasons why the e-government unit believes the major projects office governance framework cannot be adapted for e-government and IT projects? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, Ms. Conley. I don't think it's a case of thinking it cannot, because obviously, you know, it, while it may, we, we could move from one extreme to a complete extreme, and it's still an ad ad adaptation. However, we believe that it is, there are better alternatives that are fit would be could be easier adapted. Um, the, ma the, the point that that is made in there, the major projects office, the minimum threshold for a project in that to be considered is, is $10 million. And some of the projects that we have done um, range from, if, if I think, of, if we talk about third party spend, it may be 20, 20, 25,000 US over two, two to three years. If I talk about, to, to the point I think that's raised around total cost um, of projects, thinking about internal staff time and so forth, these many of these will be in the under fifty thousand range, even let alone under a hundred thousand. So I think starting with something that is that recognizes the different scales of projects and starts from accommodating small would be a better choice. So for example, one of the things that we that I, I'm looking at is the the UK government's um, project delivery framework, which which, and it recognizes that there needs to be, the, 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 the governance framework needs to adapt based on the scale and, and of the, the risk and, and value of the project. It also accommodates something that we'll speak, I imagine we'll speak about at, at a further point that the Auditor General uh, raised around the use of a project approach, management approach called Agile. They, 
UK government's model, for example, does accommodate Agile. So we are looking at other alternatives that are easier adapted, I believe, than the major projects office. Thank you, sir. Um, is there a time frame in which to have that framework um, established? Sorry, Mr. Chair. The, the, we, in, I don't have a, a hard date set at this stage. However, I am um, in the process of looking at it myself, and I have staff members that are looking at it, and I would propose that we would put this, I mean, we're, we're going to do this in consultation with the Deputy Governor's Office because one of the things that, that we have to recognize uh, as an EGov unit, um, and I trust that others recognize, is that we are but one of the entities that help with bringing services online, as the report points out, and we need something that can work for not just us, but work for the wider CIG. And so we have to consult with the others. So I would, I would um, say that I believe we're probably in a, a reasonable time frame to have this done is probably again sometime in Q1 next year. Thank you, sir. My last question um, on this area of governance framework is, um, Are there any government governance arrangements currently in place for individual e-government projects? Through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Connolly. We, we do follow um, a number of, of well, we, we fo follow standard processes. The, depending on the scale of a project, obviously some legal requirements come into play things like the procurement law and the use of business cases and so forth. So that at a bare minimum, there is what is there legally. However, we also follow, we, we go beyond that in a number of cases and we are in line with this recommendation now advising persons in line with, this, with the recommendations of the audit, for example, of business cases from, for all projects, et cetera. So we are, we have, and we are adapting those to rec recognize the recommendations. Thank you, sir. Moving on now to um, project governance roles. As previously mentioned, the Auditor General's report states that the lack of a governance framework resulted in poor governance in some instances. The Auditor General recommended project sponsors should be clearly identified at the outset and they should clearly understand their roles. I think in the report um, it speaks to the fact that um, the RCIPS, they, they really weren't clued in on their online um, platform. So my question to you is what actions are now taken to clarify, clarify project sponsors' roles and responsibilities. Through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Connolly. The, I think also in the, in the, recommend, or in the report, it speaks to the training that the Deputy Governor's um, so, uh, so the Strategic Reforms Implementation Unit under the Deputy Governor's Office, that they have provided for sponsors, et cetera. And we obviously have taken this on board and seek to make sure that in every project that we work with, the sponsors are clear. Um, I think obviously this is, a, a being taken from a training perspective is the right uh, matter. You would, you would normally expect that a, a senior leadership team would be clear on their roles with as, as project sponsors and business pro as the business process owner. Um, However, we are seeking to ensure that as we go through each project, we clarify who is the sponsor, what the roles are, and what the expectations are. I think the challenge in CIG and in, in government is those 
persons that are truly the sponsors of projects finding the necessary time that, that is truly required to be an effective sponsor in a project. Thank you, Mr. Tibbetts. That's my end of my line of questioning in this area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, too. Uh, members of the committee, we are really starting to run a bit behind time in terms of the getting through the questioning of, of this witness. Um, so as we continue with the questioning, you might want to take a look at some of the questions that we have prepared, whether we can, uh, you know, safely um, you know, not ask those questions and still maintain the thrust and of the, of the level of in, and level of the inquiry. You might also want to take a look at some of the preambles as well to see if there are any of them where you can shorten them up uh, so we can get to the essence of uh, the questions that we have to ask. So let's go ahead and proceed. The next one is, uh, the next area that we want to examine is project planning and management. And uh, Again, Mr. Rankin is going to be leaving, leading that discussion and leading those questions. Mr. Rankin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Tibbetts, as you're aware in this life and in another life before, it's good practice to prepare business case for projects that clearly set out the project's objectives and the expected benefits that will obviously justify the investments that are needed um, the other the general made note that there were only four projects reviewed that had a business case. And she also noted that you had started to prepare business case for more recent projects. Your response, you stated the business case are already required under the Procurement Act for value greater than 100,000. Also, there's note your response to recommendation three in the report said that most ID projects cost less than 10,000. So my question is, the number of business cases that the e-government union has prepared, what are the number, are jointly prepared, and the value of those projects? Do you have that information you can share with us, share this committee today? Through you, Mr. Chair. Unfortunately, I do not have that information with me today. Um, I can work to get it, to get it for you. The, I, I think you use a very salient word in there, you're jointly prepared, because obviously the business case is the responsibility of the sponsor of the project. Um, but we would be, a, we are no, normally involved in assisting and certainly um, recommending to them that they, that they implement a, a business, or execute a business case. I, I think it should be pointed out that the Four projects that were reviewed were quite some time back while and conducted with very, where there were very limited resources uh, in many cases within the department. Also, um, the, of, of the four cases reviewed, one was a complete standalone and the um, two, at least two of the others, I think, were part were um, considered to have been part of an overarching biz e-government business case. Um, so, hence the reason that there wasn't a dedicated business case for that specific project. Additionally, um, when I joined the civil service in 2014 and, and asked about this, because coming from private sector, it is you know I'm accustomed to to, to certain certain things that way. Um, to understand how, what was the, the way for accounting for and record and uh, monitoring, or sorry, reporting and, and cost of projects, et cetera. My understanding was that we focus on, it is based on third party costs. Hence the reason we, and that's where obviously again it comes into the procurement law because we're, talk, we're only talking about third party costs in that case. Now, Again, since the since this since the audit, we have been advising um, business process or sponsors that they will need to do a business case in all cases there, um, and and guiding them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How do you document for projects hundred thousand below? the objectives and expected benefits, well, for future references, 
and then in order how to justify that investment. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Rankin. Um, so even prior to the, this guidance to do a business case in all cases, we would, for, for those projects typically, and, and most of those would have been projects that are being done with in-house resources um, from, for the, it, it, a lot of our projects involve software development or, or some form of software. We would seek to, before we can scope a project, obviously we have to, to sit with the business process owners and understand their, the reason for the project, um, why, why is it that they want to do something, what is it, and what would be the scope of that project, what will need to be the deliverables. Um, if I speak to a, one of the more, one of the recent ones that you would have seen, things like the, what was done for the needs assessment unit, that was the, exactly the case. There was, an, there was a request for a, to, to have a system and improve the customer experience and service to, to the people. We explored, evaluated what the situation was, define, helped to identify what um, you know, we recognized from an outside perspective, met with the team, met with the business process owner, the ministry, et cetera, and clarified what the objectives were and agreed what a scope would be, what a timeline would be, and proposed options for how it could be done um, and what would be required. And the option chosen was the internal, was doing it with internal resources as a, almost as a triage type project. And that was, was all mapped out. And that, that's, that's the way we would do a small project. Thank you, sir, for that clarification. Um, just quickly on project plans, because I know we are mm -hmm. running short on time. For the projects that you are involved with, do you have project plans that clearly set out timelines and the team members' roles and responsibilities, all the things that surround a project plan? To you, Mr. Chair. So, I could. so the, the documents, what we, what we haven't been doing necessarily is creating a singular project plan document most of, and I think you'll see in here that many of the pieces of that, that are referenced as that, as the, 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 the standard for project plan are put together, are there, and they're in different formats, et cetera. They're not in a document format. Um, the tasks, the deliverables, the timelines, the uh, objectives, the, um, and monitoring and managing those are all all handled. The situation, I think, is around, one challenge is around the structure other than the level of structure that is normally captured in, say, the business case, because the resources on most projects in, in government are so varied, um, you know, we're unable to commit resources in most cases, so it, today it might be John, tomorrow it's, it's Jane, and the day after. So, some of that level of detail is not recorded there. It is more recorded through action planning. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, lessons learned reports. We understand that lessons learned are doc should be documents of future projects and other team members can benefit from them. And in your response to recommendation 10, that you already use project closure templates. And we also include requirements to share lessons learned to the new government EY strategy. What are the lessons learned so far from project closures within the e government unit? And if those lessons have been shared so, with the stakeholders? Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the, the project closure report has to be done and signed off by the, the, the business process owner sponsor stakeholders. So the very nature of those, we do in, in have a effectively a, a post-mortem of, of the project and, and capture those. 
the so on, on an ongoing basis yes we do do that and the those are worked through with the team i think the recommendations are very specific to the individual project um in most cases i think it there there's not a a standard or a, or a a common reoccurring recommendation that I that I can think of as we speak um, that has come out of these rec of these closure reports. It one thing I think is pro that came out of early um, closure exercises, whether even whether documented or undocumented, was the extent of testing of, of resources needed by the business process owner for testing and the, the level of testing that needed to be done um, in, during the projects. That's, that's one that has been fairly consistent across many projects. Thank you, sir. That's all my questions. Okay, we're gonna turn our attention now to performance and value for money segment of the report. And for that, I'm going to turn to Ms. Barbara Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Auditor General's report stated that the e-government unit had made significant progress in developing the National Identity Register and ID card project. However, the project requires primary legislation before it can be introduced, which is expected to be presented to Parliament later in 2022. And I understand our next meeting of Parliament could potentially be in December, okay? Um, my question is whether the supporting legislation is the only remaining barrier to launching the National ID Project and whether we are on schedule to present this to Parliament at, our next, at the next meeting. Through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Connolly. Um, Legislation is the domain of the ministry in terms of, of putting that forward, I believe. Um, however, I know that there has been significant effort on it, and I believe it is anticipated that this will be uh, brought to the next, the next um, meeting of parliament. Thank you, sir. That is very good news. I think we're all very anxious to have that up and running. My next question is on the e-government unit output measures. The Auditor General's report states that the e-government unit budgeted output measures do not align with the four objectives set out in the 2015 draft strategy. In addition, the output measures did not always measure the right things and it is not clear how they contribute to outcomes throughout the government. We note re your response to recommendation four that you will take this into consideration when developing the output measures for the next budget cycle, which is the 2024-25 cycle. However, we are aware that budget submissions for 2024-25 will need to be ready by summer of 2023 nine months time. What progress has been made in identifying better output measures to feed into the next budget cycle? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the, the I, I didn't look to find a part there before answering this, but I believe it also recognized that in the more recent um, uh, no, sorry, I'm making a mistake here. Some of the points that were that were identified here for the prior budgets, um, I think, have been improved in the current outputs that are defined. One of the 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 challenges um, that I think we have a different uh, difference of opinion on is it for us to commit to an output, we need to have an ability to influence it. Um, as, so for example, given that we are driving the, the National ID project, et cetera, we can speak more directly to that. We could have 
we can undertake outputs that are material that relate to the, the National ID project. Um, in, in some cases, you know, one of the things that was highlighted, for example, is the number of projects started. We are a project delivery partner for many of the entities. If a department starts a project and decide their priorities change or they don't um, work with us to, to, come to achieve the, the output in a timely manner, it is difficult for us to undertake a commitment in the project completion. Um, so it, it, I think those are, are where we're running in, where we've run into some problems is how we measure those things. We, haven't got, we have gotten better, we've got better data on the number of services, uh, transactions online, et cetera, and we have focused on, um, on refining those. However, again, if a business process, we can implement a project to make a particular service available online. If a business process owner does not leverage that solution to, um, to, to that in a, such a manner, for example, if they don't give those a prompt attention, so customers don't feel like they're getting the level of service from that online service, then it's not gonna have the usage. And we're, we're in a difficult situation to undertake to, to have a commitment for how many people are gonna use that service when we don't have control beyond, we can implement a solution that can support a volume. We can implement a solution that is customer friendly. If the delivery behind it or if the department uh, otherwise. So those are some examples of where we, we run into difficulty with the types of outputs that, that are desired. Um, but we definitely have improved, I believe, it, as some of the ones very specifically around where it talked about number of services, take up rates, et cetera. We now want to turn our attention to um, the couple of segments in that as well. The um, customer involvement and designing and testing of online services, and also the single website for all government online services. And for that, I'm going to turn to Ms. Kathleen Wilkes to lead that line of questioning. Ms. Wilkes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Tibbetts. Um, my first question in relation to the customer involvement in the design and testing on the online services. Uh, the government needs to have a clear understanding of customer views, including what they want and need from an online system. However, the Auditor General's report um, that reported that departments were not routinely consulting customers before developing new online services. And uh, we note that the recommendation 13, um, the response from management um, in relation to, well actually let me just go over the recommendation. Recommendation 13 focuses on customer testing rather than system design. And we know that management generally suggests customer testing, but that you cannot force, I think you, you stated in your response that you cannot force business owners to comply with customer testing. So I was just wondering if you're able to speak on any of the risks that you find um, are associated with not carrying out or acting on the results of customer testing. Through you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Ebanks folks. Um, we, so for, for it, let me break it into two categories, projects that eGov, so for some of the projects that we're currently doing like National ID, um, eGov is is heavily um, involved in, in as a as a process owner at least initially. Um, so for all of the projects we're involved in, we very actively seek customer input as we go through. We test and we we ensure that that we involve customer testing. Um, in terms of the the customer input in the in the service. We seek to glean that from a variety of ways through, in many cases, um, customer feedback, uh, 
that has come through in terms of complaints. Some of those come through from the, de the deputy governor, some or the deputy governor's office to different departments, ministries, etc. We are also actively using for existing services the happy or not customer satisfaction feedback tool and taking all of those things on board. We also employ in our more recent um, uh, projects, we have been contracting for or using in where it's available internally, user experience and user interface expertise, design expertise to address those aspects. One thing that, that coming from private sector, you know, we start with, clearly we, we, we would want to start with the customer, make sure that how um, that we design a solution that a customer will buy. In the civil service, in some cases, it's a little different in that you have, there's, the service has to comply with a law. So that's a first, that's a fundamental, you have to first meet the law. That's not to say that if the customer's feedback is suggesting that um, the law, it, or the process as defined by law or applied to fill the law is cumbersome and, and problematic that the law can't be changed to, to facilitate a different um, type of user experience. But I, I think the, the, to try to get to a pointed answer for your question, we use customer testing. We seek, uh, if right now with the, you, you mentioned the portal. The portal is in what we would call a soft launch stage and we are actively collecting customer feedback. We are uh, also inviting persons to participate in, a, in focus groups to more, get more pointed um, feedback on, on the service and that will be incorporated into the design. Um, we all, and as I said, anytime we are assisting a, another entity with a project, we seek to understand the customer perspective because that needs to factor into the design and it needs to factor in, and then we need to test it to ensure that it has been achieved. So is it safe to say then that your position has changed in relation to your response to recommendation 13 and you are now acting on the results of customer testing? Through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think it is significantly different from what's here. I think what I've clarified is that there, in the cases where eGov is the project uh, owner, uh, then we we employ uh, the the standards as are recommended, basically. In the case of where we are a project de delivery partner for an existing entity, we do our endeavor best to extract that information and we advise the, cu the business process owner. However, we don't have the authority to dictate. Thank you. I actually have one more question on that. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Do, Just go ahead. So, um, in relation to um, can you also just share your views on how we can, or how you can involve customers then in the design of the online services? Through you, Mr. Chair. So um, there, there are a number of different methods that are viable. Um, some work better than others in different cultures. And one of, a, a, a common way is that the, if it's a brand new service from the ground up, you know, you engage and you get input from customers and, and how this might be designed, um, what are some, what are the things that they would specifically want and what they wouldn't want, and you reflect those accordingly. If it is an enhancement or revision of, of it, something that's existing, oftentimes um, you're able to get a lot of good insight to start with and you can then propose a, 
a, a way forward, you know, so and, and then ask for customer feedback on it. Um, of, and generally, I have found here that the latter tends to work better. Um, finally, when we started with a blank sheet, um, it, we've struggled to get out, get some of the, the get material benefit. It's, it's been much easier for someone to critique something, they, they like it or they don't like it or they want it different than to start and say, well, what would you want? Because it, it isn't necessarily the role to have thought of that. Mr. Tibbetts, we're down to the final area, sec final area of the report that we wish to question you on. Uh, so we're near the end of it, uh, and we want to turn attention now to the monitoring of, of project costs. Um, can you tell the committee whether the time spent by the e-government unit and computer services department on e-government and IT projects is currently being tracked? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think what I would have to say is accurately no, because we don't, we're not in a situation where we have a luxury of um, dedicating resources in many cases. Some, there are some cases we do, and that, that we have that ability so we can dedicate a project manager on a, on a big project to be full time, we can dedicate a business analyst to be on a project for a particular period of time, or we can dedicate a, a developer or two developers or whatever. But in many cases, it is, it is very varied amounts of time throughout the course of a day um, by different people. And um, I've only spoke, you asked about CSD and eGov, so I've only spoken to that, that area. Obviously, this, this applies in the business process owner as well. <coughs> um, and we don't have, we currently don't have a, a mecha mechanism to accurately record that time. Um, I think, it, so this was, this was something that has been um, brought up with the, the, the finance team as well, because I think Dodd Dod Jones office asked about you know, this, this for capitalization. Um, there is a new system being implemented in government that has a different method of time tracking. The extent to which this can be used to facilitate this is um, yet to be determined, I would say, from my perspective. But r as of right now, uh, I think it would be onerous and, and inaccurate on the, with the current methods for us to try to reliably capture the amount of time on any one specific project by a particular person so that we can we can um, we can do deal with that just quick, quick follow-on question I mean government has a time recording system a method of and, and system for tracking time for you know for, for staff is this not being utilized by your unit in terms of tracking these internal costs of developing software the, so th thank you, Mr. Chair. The, we're in the transition now between two different systems and the new system, which is called, I think it's called MyVista, that the time we have yet to start using or the, the, the time tracking in the way that it would be required to achieve what we're seeking here, which is really being able to track it uh, at a fairly granular level because of the constant moving between projects that we have. You do agree with me, though, well, I don't want to put it as a leading question. Um, Fair to say then that in terms of these projects that you have been engaged in, that you have delivered, that there is no recognition in the costs of developing these um, 
these services, the e-government services, that there is no cost of the human resources, i.e. time, uh, that is built into or recorded in terms of the overall cost of, uh, of these uh, services or, or software, whatever it is you want to call it, that, uh, that you have delivered for government. Mr. Chair, it is accurate to say it currently it is not act, it is not recorded in such a way. Correct. Um, I think it would be reasonable that we could provide, and even for for certainly in recent projects and, and even before that, probably we can provide some reasonable estimates of what it would be. However, it isn't definitive, and I think one of the things that from the some of the accounting standards mentioned for that apply apparently specifically indicated that it that you can only from a this is isn't from the project side I think this is more from the asset valuation side of it that it's only if you only and only if the the time can be accurately recorded okay so when you give estimates then of some you know some of these project costing 10 up to 50 maybe most of them being less than a hundred thousand dollars the only real costs that you are focused in on there are going to be your um, hard costs or external, you know, costs of ex external services or professionals that you might need to co-opt or whatever, or in order to um, to deliver on these projects that there is no dealing of any sort of soft internal costs in 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 identifying the overall costs of the projects. Uh, Mr. Chair, so. As I think you may recall from earlier, I was able to give an indication for like the the uh, scholarship secretariat project. I understand what the third party cost is, and I have a uh, based on experience to date, I have a reasonable estimate of the staff cost as well. But it is very much an estimate; it is not based on a measured. Um, it is. All right. Thank you for those uh, for those answers as well. Um, the Auditor General, in her report, recommended that key performance indicators for projects should be clearly that they are clearly defined, monitored, and reported. Uh, in your response, you said that said that this is a matter for the business case primarily and has to heavily involve the business process owner. I understand that. Um, but you also said that the e-government unit would address it in the government-wide e-government strategy. Uh, can you tell me whether the e-government unit can assist business owners in developing performance indicators and how you can assist them in doing so? Um, for all of the projects that you're involved in pending a government-wide e-commerce, e-government strategy. So look in whether you can help and how. Yes, sir. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So in terms of we can, and, and we continue to do this, uh, when, they, when they consult us on a business case, a draft business case, what we're ab often able to do is because of experience, recognize where benefits may be actually realized uh, and measurable and identify to those, to, to the persons, those benefits. The other thing is we also recommend to them that in some cases they will need to capture baseline data that may require manual exercises. They may need to count and measure time as to how many. This was something we did with the police clearance um, system, for example. We hired a team of interns and sent them literally to the office. They measured everyone from the time they came through the door to the time they were at the counter, the time they left the counter, the time they exited the door, how much time it, it spent. They interviewed them and kept identified how many um, visits they, they, would have, they would have to make, where they came from so that we could estimate. And, and they provided estimates of how their travel time how much time of their day this was costing, et cetera. 
um, so that we got a baseline perspective and we could then identify, okay, so if we, because the project that, that was reviewed here was delivered the first phase, which eliminated 50% of the visits for if you use the online service. You didn't have to go to apply and, and then return. You only had to, you only had to return or go to collect it, should say. So we were, those are things, for example, where we would help them with identifying how they can establish a baseline and how they, and, and what such a, a metric might look like for the outcome. Well, that concludes my uh, line of questioning, unless members of the committee have other questions they wanted to raise with, uh, with the director. No? Okay. Mr. Tibbetts, I want to thank you for appearing before the committee uh, this morning, and I want to thank you for your responses to the questions, and uh, I'm going to excuse you at this time, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for, to the committee for the opportunity to present to you. Okay, members, uh, let's take a five-minute break.
Thank you all for returning to the chamber quite expeditiously. We want to move on next to our uh, second uh, witnesses in the next session. And for that, I'm going to call on Mr. Eric Bush, uh, who is the ministry, who is the chief officer in the Ministry of Planning, Housing, Agriculture, and Infrastructure, and is a former chief officer of the Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development, as well as Ms. Tamara Ebanks, who is the acting chief officer in the Ministry of Innovation, Investment, Innovation, and Social Development. Good afternoon, Mr. Bush and Ms. Ebanks. Welcome to uh, Public Accounts Committee and welcome to this hearing. I know you all are familiar with the, the report and we're here to get the uh, ministry's uh, viewpoints with regard to the contents and recommendations of that report. So I'm glad that you're both here. Uh, Mr. Bush, you're here uh, in, in terms of your role as the former um, chief officer in the ministry that has oversight for the e-government unit and Ms. Ebanks, you to bring the, 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 you know, the, as the successor as well. So I recognize in terms of the course of the questioning, uh, both of you might not be able to answer a question and, and there, there is no real need for both of you, but you may need to you know, go between each other to determine who is best to answer the questions as we, we go along. So I just have a very brief preamble to, uh, to read here uh, for you both. Uh, the Auditor General's report states that the government first launched its e-government initiative in 2010. Report acknowledges that significant progress has been made since then with a number of government services available online. We understand from your response to the Auditor General's recommendations that the Ministry and the e-government unit plan to develop a government-wide e-government strategy. However, we also understand that developing the government-wide strategy is going to take some time. Therefore, we are keen to know what measures can be taken to address the Auditor General's recommendations in the meantime, and members will follow up on this during our hearing. We heard from the Director of e-Government earlier this morning and are now interested in your perspective from the Ministry level. We appreciate that the e-government unit only moved into the Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development in July 2021. And so you may not be able to answer historical questions. We also realize that the e-government unit is not involved in all e-government projects across government. However, we are interested in your ministry and the e-government's role in the e-government program and those projects that the e-government unit is involved in. So the first line of question that we are going to wish to explore with you is the strategic direction and governance issues. And for that, I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Isaac Rankin to lead the questioning there. As he asks the questions, for, you know, for the first time that each of you might answer a question, please just state your name and position for the record. 
So welcome to the committee, Mr. Rankin. Please lead off with the questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome you both to this hearing. Um, as the Auditor General had noted in her report, and the Chairman alluded to the need for a government strategy, which is aligned with good practice and cited in the United Nations guidance. Um, the Director had also prepared a revised e-government strategy in, 19, in 2021, and that was after 2015 when it kind of got put on pause. The Auditor General then said that the draft improved, the draft improved on the previous version but had significant, still had significant gaps, and it didn't specifically mention objectives to improve the efficiency of joining up government. However, as the chairman has also mentioned, it may take some time to develop and finalize a revised strategy, which we understand. But what we'd like to know is what is the ministry's role in developing the proposals for cabinet and a new strategy? What would be the ministry's role in doing that? Tamara Ebanks, Acting Chief Officer for the Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the Ministry's role um, would be to assist in the drafting of the Cabinet paper for the proposal for the CIG-wide uh, e-government strategy. Um, you will note from the recommendations in the Auditor General's report um, that we definitely accept that recommendation. Um, we had an implementation time frame for quarter four of 2022. And with the focus right now um, on the national ID legislation and identification register, um, we don't think that that's a realistic time frame anymore because of the resources that um, are being taken to have to progress the legislation um, and that particular project forward. So we, um, we feel that quarter one of 2023 would be a more realistic time frame for implementation, and we would support the e-government uh, unit in putting that proposal forward to Cabinet. Thank you, Ms. Ebanks. That leads to something I'd like to bring up now, based on what the, the, um, the director mentioned in his um, presentation earlier today. That is, he mentioned about outsourcing some of this but we do know that ministry has policy officers, so why can't they assist the director and his team to develop in some of these policies versus outsourcing it? You have a 2015 draft that didn't go anywhere, and you have an updated 2021 draft. Um, with that in mind, and assistance from the ministry down to the e-government unit, can you now say if that will make things better and help speed it up, if you can give them some support from the policy officer level. Through you, Mr. Chair, at this time, I would not be aware of the scope of work that that would entail. Um, while we can offer our support from our senior policy advisors and also our acting deputy chief officer for, for investment and innovation, the scope of work in terms of what we would like to even see um, in that proposal has not been discussed uh, with the minister or, or eGov in, the ter in terms of what it would take to actually produce that proposal for that strategy. Thank you, but based on what you said, do you think no Q1 on 2023 is going to be realistic then? Through you, Mr. Chair. Because of the resources that, are, that is taken to, to do the National ID project, um, it gives us a little bit more time if we aim for a target time frame of quarter one of 2023 to understand the direction we need to go and what would be included in the CIG government-wide strategy. Thank you. What assurances that can the minister give that the new e-government strategy will align with good practices and address the gaps that the Auditor General, namely improving efficiency and joined up government? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, we have to, we have accepted the recommendations from the Auditor General's report. 
um, and noted the concerns um, of efficient, improving efficiency and also a joined up government. Um, we, would, we would expect any strategy would have that and include that, sir. We also asked the director earlier um, how the new government strategy will, will incorporate the needs of users who may not readily have access to the internet. Um, could you comment on that and give us, from the minister's perspective, feedback on that, please? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we would actually consult with the government on how to address uh, those um, those uh, problems and look at identified solutions. Um, there may not be one single solution, but I think through consultation we'll be able to address that. What would be the minister's role in assessing of the e-government program against the United Nations criteria that the Auditor the General mentioned in the report? Through you, Mr. Chair. We would work really closely with the e-government unit to look at the United Nations criteria and whether it could be fit for purpose for this jurisdiction. Can you provide an, can the minister provide an update on the assessment and how it will be used in form new a new e-government strategy? This is from the UN criteria's point of view. Through you, Mr. Chair, I do not have the answer to that at that time because at this time because the work has not um, started to look at that UN criteria. Thank you, Ms. Ebanks. Okay. Looking on, turning on now to the governance arrangements for the e-government programs, I turn to Ms. Barbara Connolly for that line of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon to our witnesses. My question is is actually relating to the e-government steering committee. The Auditor General's report highlights that formal governance and oversight arrangements for the e-government program was not in place after April 2017. In response to the Auditor General's recommendation, you stated that fit for purpose governance arrangements would be developed as part of the new government wide e-government strategy. What oversight of the e-government program is currently in place and who provides that oversight? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the e-government program is in consultation with the ministry um, at this time in terms of what projects that they can undertake um, and what entities they can assist in terms of any online services. Um, I was not um, privy to the governance framework in terms of the e-government steering committee that would have been before my time. Um, so I, I cannot speak specifically to that. Thank you, Ms. Ebanks. Um, what is the role of the ministry then in providing governance and oversight 
for the e-governance programme. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Eric Bush, uh, Chief Officer of Ministry of Planning, Agriculture, Housing and Infrastructure, uh, previous Chief Officer for uh, Innovation in this context. I think, I think it's important, uh, Mr. Chair, to, to explain there's, there's two things at play when we're talking about e-government. There's e-government as a strategy, and then there's e-government as a functioning operational government department. Um, as been as highlighted and agreed by the Auditor General and her office, there is a need to have a e-government wide strategy that the entire government would be responsible for implementing. It would touch all of the departments, all of the customers, and how they interact with government, government services, communication, which would include aspects of cybersecurity, data protection, customer service, process re-engineering, implementation, etc. And then there's the other angle, then there's the other side of the operational arm of e-government that you heard from the director today. And they have been working towards digitizing the, the, the various government services in line with government priorities. But I think that the, the big gap as identified and as agreed to be, um, to be advanced and presented to the government is a e-governance or e-government e strategy. Uh, in terms of the ministry's role of performance management for the operational arm, it is in line with implementing the priorities of the government of the day and the projects in which they want to, to see implemented. I hope that helps. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Um, one other question is what assurances can you all give this committee that the government arrangements will be included in this government-wide e-government strategy? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I can give assurances that we will have a proposal ready by quarter one of 2023. Thank you, Ms. Banks. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> okay, my next question um, is relating governance framework for e-government projects. The Auditor General's report stated that there is no overreaching governance framework for e-government projects. For example, project sponsors not being clear about their roles and key project documents not being reviewed and approved. Say for instance, with RCIPS and their um, online police clearance certificate, they, don't, they didn't seem to have very much um, knowledge of how that all works. It was basically more from the director and from the um, e-government department. The Auditor General recommended that the major project office govern governance framework for major capital projects could be adapted. However, this recommendation was not accepted with cited differences in the values of e-government projects as the main reason. Can you all state what the reasons, the reasons why the ministry believes the major project office governance framework cannot be adapted to e-government and IT projects? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the major projects office um, criteria is applicable to projects that are over $10 million, and most of the projects that have been undertaken are under that value. 
But wouldn't the framework be similar? Just a bit of tweaking? Or would that be substantially, um, just wouldn't, wouldn't apply? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I agree with the, the recommendations from the Auditor General's report in terms of the project sponsors and knowing their, their roles. In terms of the framework from the major projects office, once again, it would have to be fit for purpose for the particular project that we are undertaking. Um, so uh, we would have to look closely at that criteria to see whether or not it could, f it could be fit for purpose for projects that are under the 10 million. I could just follow up uh, just from my perspective. Um, I, I, I understand the recommendation, and I, I think really where I focus on it is a taking and adapting it. It is a framework. It is something that everybody in government knows about, and if they're doing any sort of procurement, they are familiar with it and work with it. So I, I think what the recommendation really was looking for is for ways in which it could be scaled to make it fit for purpose. Um, my, I, I get it as it exists, it, doesn't, it isn't fit for purpose. Uh, and I think we all agree that. But I, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I mean, they, I think the recommendation suggests if you, you have to go out and source or develop a new framework. It's just another framework that everybody's gonna to have to do. It just seemed to be more efficient and, and, and more likely that you get much stronger buy-in and follow through with, with taking something that already exists and cutting out what you don't need and adding what you do need to, to, to make it fit for purpose. Now, I think that's, that's, that's where I think the recommendation comes from and where it, what it is trying to achieve here. And it strikes me that just simply rejecting it just because it, it, it applies to things over $10 million is, is, is not necessarily the right thing to do. I think I really, I, I would encourage, because I'm not really asked you a question, but try to explain that, that, that the ministry and or the, the office unit take a real closer look at it and revisit the whole thing once again. To, to see what can be done, because I think we could have something in place quite quickly. Mr. Bush. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair, the uh, Acting Chief Officer and I spoke briefly, and we agreed that, because the major project office now falls under my remit, that we will, we will have a meeting with the um, subject matter experts in project management and the Ministry of Innovation and e-government to see how we can adapt and, and create a framework not recreating the wheel. Thank you, sir. <laughs>
And my question is what measures currently are currently in place for the Ministry to hold to account the e-government unit for its performance? Through you, Mr. Chair. In the Ministry, um, we ask for monthly Cabinet reports in terms of the performance of all of our departments not only just financial reporting, but output reporting as well. Um, that's one thing that we can hold them accountable in terms of monitoring the performance of the unit. Um, we do hold regular meetings between ministry and e-government unit as well. Um, also, uh, as you would know, we produce an annual report which would also look at the performance of the e-government unit under the ministry as well. Um, and also looking at using uh, some of the project tracking documents that, that we do have. Um, we have um, agreed to the recommendations in terms of having these things as best practice. Um, so we will be closely working with them um, to also include this in the e-government-wide strategy, e -government strategy for government. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Moving on now to the National ID Program. The report stated that e-government unit had made significant progress in developing the National Identity Register and ID Card project. However, the project requires primary legislation before it can be introduced, which is expected to be presented to Parliament later in 2022. Can you give some assurance that, that this legislation will be presented to Parliament? Um, at the next meeting, which I understand could potentially be in December. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are on track for that target um, to be implemented to bring the legislation forward to Parliament. I do have a follow-on, if I could, because I'm just keenly interested in it. But legislation is... Uh, is just the one part is one part you know it is a critical element but the actual uh, in terms of the back end of it and whatever software or whatever it is you need to develop or have in place is that all ready to go uh, yes mr chairman that that was procured um in within the last year and and uh, the the company um, that won the public bid uh, is is a company that is well versed in in national IDs this this is their business that's good to know so I mean I'm just trying to in my own mind to formulate some view or idea as to when it might be a reasonable expectation that we could see this program actually commence operations. Through you, Mr. Chair, I don't have that information with me, but I can actually pr provide that to the committee in terms of the implementation timeframe for launch. I, I do appreciate that, and thank you. I wasn't looking for a hard firm, firm date to hold you to just some sort of indication, first quarter, second quarter, Late 2023, who knows, you know. Okay, thanks. Okay, this is my last um, line of question in it. It's on the e-government unit's output measures. The Auditor General's report states that e-government unit budgeted output measures to, to measures do not align with the four objectives set out in the 2015 draft strategy. In addition, the output measures did not always measure the right things, and it is not clear how they contribute to outcomes throughout the government. We note your responses to recommendation four states that this will be taken into consideration when developing the output measures for the next budget cycle, which is 2024-25. However, we are aware that budget submissions for 2024-25 will need to be ready by summer of 2023, which is nine short months away. 
What is the role of the ministry in identifying better output measures for the e-government unit in advance of the next budget cycle? Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the ministry works very closely with the e-government unit to produce the outputs, um, output measures for the 24 and 25 budget. I was not involved in the preparation of the output measures for the 22 and 23 budget, but I can give assurances that we will work with uh, e-government unit to improve on those output measures for the next upcoming budget period. Are there other questions from the committee? Okay. We got through with you quickly. <laughs> Mr. Bush and Ms. Ebanks, thank you both for appearing here this, this morning. Sorry we, were, sorry we were a little bit late with you, but uh, we finished up exactly on time. And uh, I thank you for your appearance this morning and for the frank way in which you answered our questions. You're excused at this time. Thank you all. Members of the committee, it is now 12.30. We will go ahead and take the lunch break and we will recommence at 1.30 sharp. Uh, our final witness in this for today will be, and Ms. Heron will be the Deputy Governor, Mr. Fran, the Honorable Franz Mandison, who will join us at 1.30. Thank you all.